Welcome to As Read By Me, the podcast where writers read and readers listen. In this episode, we have a short story from Peter Waits, a poem from Paul Camerata, and an essay from Don Tollefson. Hello, my name is Peter Waits. This is Go to Hull, as read by me. Hull is a seaside community in Massachusetts. In November 1968, three months after I completed my active duty in the Air Force, we bought a house at 11 S Street in Hull. It was a large, four-bedroom colonial, just a three-minute walk from the bay, and because Hull is a narrow peninsula, we could easily walk across Nantasket Avenue to the ocean in just five minutes. I have a lot of fond memories of the years we spent there. You know who, that's what I call my wife, you know who hadn't been feeling well. She had what had been going around, a really, really bad cold, manifested with sneezing, wheezing, and coughing. A friend decided that chicken soup would be helpful for the physical ailment bothering her. She also kindly gave you know who some magazines, figuring they'd be helpful to take her mind off her discomfort. One of the magazines was a book of puzzles, the South Shore Puzzle Journal, from Hull, Massachusetts. The day after we received these wonderful gifts, I went online to Facebook and saw another friend had a story about Hull. The confluence of two disparate people with a connection to Hull was kismet, and it reminded me of the time we lived in Hull. For those of you who don't know anything about Hull, as the crow flies... Hull is only about 20 miles from Boston. There's a bay that separates it, but geographically it's really very, very close. And one of the more popular radio stations in the area was WHDH. And the disc jockey was a man named Jess Kane. And he used to call Hull an insula peninsula, jutting out into the Atlantic Ocean. Actually, if you look at it on a map... It looks like a miniature Cape Cod. The shapes are almost identical. In the summer, from the end of June to Labor Day, it had about 100,000 inhabitants. On Labor Day, 95,000 of the 100,000 people packed up and went back to wherever they called home. The traffic lights were either turned off or converted to blinkers. The parking meters were put away. The prevailing attitude of the Aaron residents was that the summer residents were a necessary evil. They paid taxes, and they left the townies with the responsibility to run the town. Most of us have never lived in a democracy. Most of us have only lived with a representative form of government. Hull, with its roots going back to the colonial period, had a real democracy. Twice a year we had a town meeting, and every citizen was encouraged to attend and to participate. Town meetings were where the funds to run the town were voted on, for example, if the street department needed a new $4.95 shovel, the funds to buy it were discussed and voted on at this meeting. Since everyone knew what a shovel was, and everyone knew what $4.95 was, the discussion about the shovel could take an hour. Why do we need it? What happened to the old shovel? How old was the old shovel? Was it broken through negligence? The debate was endless. However... If an item was an expensive widget that no one knew anything about, if it cost millions of dollars, then the discussion and approval regarding its purchase was accepted as soon as the reading of it was completed. This is also where we openly discussed the salaries of every person who worked for the town. Every Wednesday night, there was a selectmen's meeting. And again, every citizen was invited to attend and to participate. It was at these selectmen's meetings where the everyday mundane and trivial items that needed to be dealt with were discussed. The atmosphere was close to being informal. Because of the incredible entertainment that regularly took place, I rarely missed these meetings. One of my favorite stories took place in the late summer, toward the end of August. There was a parade of people complaining about a dog that was running wild on Green Hill. Green Hill was at the beginning of the beach, right behind Paragon Park. According to the complainers, and there were about 20 of them, 
The dog was defecating on people's lawns. The dog was knocking over garbage cans. The dog was terrorizing people that were out walking. The dog was running through the flower beds and rooting them. The selectmen, Marty Fallon, Wally Richardson, and David Berman, sat patiently as each complaint was given. David had just recently replaced Simi Hearthstone. David was the clean-cut, square-jawed reform candidate elected to clean up the honky-tonk bars. Standing at the back of the room, leaning against the wall, was a man with his arms folded. He had a scowl on his face. It was obvious that he was the owner of the dog. After the last complaint was given, the chairman, Marty Fallon, spoke to the man who had been leaning against the wall. He asked him what he had to say. The owner stood up. He took a step or two forward, and in a loud voice, this is what he said. Ah, fuck him! They're all summer residents, and they're all going home next week anyway. The room, including the three selectmen, roared with laughter. And that ended the meeting. I never heard another word about it, so I guess the complainers went home as forecast, and the dog continued to run amok. In house democracy, with a 20-to-1 majority, the one because he was a year-round resident, he prevailed. Hi, this is Paul Camerata, and this is Song for the Hammerhead, as read by me. When you're a hammer, all you see is nails. A steam locomotive, plain and simple, rails. If a haymaker, everywhere bails. When you're a slammer, all you see are jails. For a bucket maker, all the world's a pail. To the wind, everything's a sail. When you're a storyteller, always a tale. A lover of salad, only has eyes for kale. The weatherman, a nose for hail and gale. In the archer's mind, each day a hunt for quail. To the letter writer, there is only the mail. To the bargain hunter, it's yet another sail. To the scholar, the world is a limitless Yale. To the skier, the whole globe, a road leading to Vale. Or if a hiker, one unending trail. For a seafood chef, and also a whale, the world's an ocean, chock full of snail. Just as breadcrumb makers covet the stale, when you're a hammer, all you see is nails. Hi, I'm Don Tollison, and this is Always Avoiding Cooperation, as read by me. When a person does or says something I disagree with, I usually pause and count to 10 unless there is a need for immediate action. Otherwise, try and discern what was behind their action and or their statement. A rush to judgment is usually a potential rush to foolishness instead. When you jerk your knee vigorously, you may very likely slam it into a solid wall. Take time to see if you can find out what someone else is going through in their life. That can be a very challenging process, but it is worth the effort. So many of the recovering addicts I work with in my counseling profession have background stories that are so sad and that frequently created an almost inevitable sequence preceding their mistakes. This is not to excuse those often devastating mistakes, But in understanding what caused them, you will probably react with a less harsh judgment and also sympathy and or empathy. Thank God and so many people as well that I am 2,781 days clean and sober as I prepare this essay. In 40 plus years of addiction that preceded my miraculous recovery, I made so many mistakes. And had it not been for people who did not rush to judgment and who usually also believed in second chances and opportunities for redemption, I would not be anywhere near the positive place I am right now in my life at 68 years young. How bad is it right now in American politics? I really feel 
that if a person walked up to almost every member of Congress and said, I have a program that can guarantee world peace in 24 hours, and all you have to do is sign a proclamation supporting my efforts. The response from a lot, if not almost all members of Congress, would be to first ask, are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? And if that person really did have a plan that would create that world peace miracle, they would respond to you if you belong to the other party by saying that not only do they have no interest in supporting 24-hour instant world peace, they also plan to start a petition to have you vigorously condemned for this outrage. Is this any way to run a legislative body? Is this any way to run our country? A country I feel is the greatest in world history, despite our flaws. But it is definitely a country where bipartisan cooperation and compromise paved the way to greatness again and again. We deserve better today, and we should demand it. Maybe we should try a third party. The cooperation party sounds doable. If two people cannot agree that a beautiful walk through nature is a positive, just because one of you is a Democrat and one of you is a Republican, then your absurdity is beyond disappointing. If you feel I am exaggerating, watch one of the C-SPAN networks for just a few minutes. Bipartisanship is on the endangered species list, closer to extinction than revival. And that is a terrible shame. Thanks for joining us. You can find show notes at asreadbyme.com. If you're a writer and would like to read something on an upcoming episode, send an email to writers at asreadbyme.com. For advertising inquiries, send an email to partners at asreadbyme.com.